Depending on which country you live in and a couple of other factors, you might find yourself in a thing called quarantine from time to time. And a common question that understandably comes up whenever you have close to infinite free time for months on end is... What the hell do I even play anymore? You can only boot up an action-packed, story-rich and gameplay complex game for so long before you get burned out, and these years will likely be the time when lots of people start realizing that. Along with the fact that rushing a game like that can make it forgettable, you might not enjoy it that much, not quite as much as if you give yourself some time to look forward to it a little more. You know, while you're at work or school, if you had the time to think about what you're playing, think about what's gonna happen next, and actually remember the bosses, characters and story moments that way. But we don't do that, because lots of us don't have anything that stops us from playing games for at least 10 hours a day, or rather, nothing else to do instead. But this is not a tirade against binge playing, or binge watching, or binging anything, even though it should be. This is a video in which I'll tell you why the role-playing game Stardew Valley is the absolute perfect one to play during quarantine, or whenever really, if you have lots of free time and nothing to fill it with. And most importantly, why it might even give you back that looking forward feeling, seeing as you never seem to get enough time in the day to play Stardew Valley as much as you want, as long as your body still requires sleep that is. Oh, and I'll also generally view it afterwards of course. Don't skip the first part if you just want the review however, as it comments on the game just as much. I've also left out all the parts of the game I don't have anything to say about, so as to spoil the least of it as I can. This video does contain spoilers, but I've omitted all the story related ones, and those that are left I don't believe should cause any problems. You decide for yourself though. If you want the simple answer, yes, the game is 100% worth your money, go spend 2000 hours on it and come back afterwards. Anyway, make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to never miss my uploads, share my videos with your friends and give them a like or comment, it helps and motivates me a ton, and let's get started. Firstly, what even is Stardew Valley? Stardew Valley is an indie life sim role playing game that was released all the way back in February of 2016. It's made by just one guy, Eric Barone, aka Concerned Ape. It got a critical acclaim immediately, skyrocketing to Steam's top 10 best rated games of all time, and has been sitting there getting frequent updates ever since. The premise of the game is simple enough, your blank slate character gets tired of their day-to-day -day job and decides to settle down in Stardew Valley, at their departed grandfather's old farm. You have... Um, a couple of activities to choose from. Renovate the dilapidated place, plant crops and trees, build coops and barns for your animals, refine your agricultural products into various items so sell them as is, cut down trees and forage for food and plants, venture into the mines to mine rocks and kill stuff, calm down with some fishing, socialize and build relationships with the townspeople, complete their quests, get married, have a child, restore the community center, fill up the museum with artifacts, minerals and books, wait I have to collect every single item in the damn game, what there is an infinite mine, and a quarry without monsters and respawning ores, and next to it is this long dungeon with the flying skulls from Doom, what? Whoa, there's even events every single year and... Basically, live a life. And that's why it's the perfect quarantine game, because you can continue to live your life like nothing hap- Okay, jokes aside. Why is Stardew Valley the perfect quarantine game? Number 1. It has no set end. That's a big plus. You can squeeze a ton of gameplay out of a game with a set end, but still never reach the hundreds of hours you can in Stardew Valley. Here you can keep on playing, doing the same stuff until you get bored. And one day you'll log out and leave your farm. Well, that's kinda sad. For real though, there are in fact a finite number of goals for you to achieve, but some of them are so difficult that you'd have to have fallen in love with the game so much upon achieving them that you'll probably continue playing for a while afterwards. Either that, or you're the most extremely dedicated completionist of all time. However, while this ultimate no set end approach does help tremendously with the quarantine game part of the deal, it provides a kind of anticlimactic end to your journey as well. You don't stop playing while still in love with a game, one that just ended for either a story reason or something else, you stopped playing because you got bored. It's like having a TV show with 10,000 episodes that no one will probably ever watch the entirety of, and instead quit whenever they get bored. It doesn't really force you to stop while you still love it, you stop whenever you don't. Thus, a no set end game has its positives and negatives, so it's really about what you are looking for. And the advantages that we're looking for, being able to play as much as possible, are what is present. And you will play it a lot, since, number 2, this is easily one of the most addictive games out there. It adds all of these little touches that make the sense of accomplishment so much greater. Instead of harvesting your crops and just selling them on the spot one by one, you get to see all of them collect at once at the end of the day. You don't get your money upon completing the quest, you get to open your log and retrieve it from there. 
and the game doesn't have an XP bar that's constantly in view, informing you of when exactly you hit mining 3, instead you get little surprises at the end of each day. It's not alright if I mine 20 more ores, I think I'll be there, but rather, oh, level 3? I guess I did mine quite a bit today. Good job, me. It's so addictive, it's easily among those like the Binding of Isaac's latest pyre and Into the Breach, maybe even better. They are also all non-narrative driven, so you can stop playing at any time, then come back in a couple of months and continue playing just like that. That's great for number 3, accessibility. Since a lot of new people are getting into gaming right now and won't have yet evolved to stare at a monitor for 12 hours a day for 3 whole months and not have a single headache. This is just a very minor point of accessibility though. More importantly, the previous 3 games I mentioned take either a good amount of mental focus or great mechanical skill, yet Stardew Valley allows you to play at your own pace. You can either micromanage everything and be maximally efficient just for the sake of completing everything as fast as possible, or you can spend 10 days carelessly cutting wood and going to the mines. This is a sandbox after all and it's great that the player can set their own expectations when it comes to productivity instead of having the game make it mandatory for them, since it's one without a set goal anyway. In that way, Stardew Valley is suited for any amount of challenge you might be seeking without having an actual difficulty setting, you decide how hard to make the game on yourself. That means that for non-gamers, jeez I hate using that word, there is no intimidation for trying out the game. I saw this 60 year old lady posting on the r slash Stardew Valley subreddit about her and her husband getting into the game, without having played any in the past. So if you know how to use a keyboard and mouse, you probably can too. And remember that googling things isn't shameful or not the true experience or anything like that. Number 4, it completely consumes your time. Some people might say that the activities you have to do might seem a little grindy, but I like grinding, kind of a lot. Some people don't, but I really do. I don't believe I've ever put down a game just because it's grindy. However, I put all of these clearly grindy games into two different categories. One where it's executed well, and one where it isn't. While most people seem to go with good games and grindy games. Terraria, Minecraft and Stardew Valley all have a ton of grinding, yet I almost never hear people call them or shame them for that, and they are some of the most critically acclaimed titles out there. That's because the games are extremely satisfying and sometimes engaging, so you don't even notice the grind when it is there. Having to just mine the two blocks in front of you for an hour is pretty grindy, I think, but having to look out for ore, get the satisfaction of picking up the materials, listen for lava, put down torches, and at times fight off enemies makes it somehow… not. And this applies to Terraria and Stardew Valley more or less. Not to get off topic, but the best example is World of Warcraft, where the commonly agreed on best versions of the game, Classic and Burning Crusade, happen to be the ones with unbelievable amounts of grinding, way more than any of its inferior successors. But back to Stardew Valley, the blatant grind is made actually fun, and thus it isn't stamped with the grinding label that seems to be pretty much synonymous with bad these days. More on passing time, the game is also split into short days, this helps tremendously. I'm not just watering the plants, checking the calendar, going to the beach and fishing, going to mine and then repeating all of it until I get bored, I'm trying to fit every single one of these tasks into my day. This change makes everything feel so much more organic, even though it's a minor one. Even more importantly, it gives you such a worth perception of time, it makes many in-game days fly by in a flash. I thought a single day couldn't possibly be more than 8 minutes, with accounting for pausing while fishing of course, but it turns out they're 13 minutes. Be honest, how many of you were able to guess that? And the game only saves the beginning of each day, which means you're always looking forward to something when you're trying to log off. You keep saying just one more day and before you know it, it's 3am. Number 5, there's so much content in Stardew Valley, I can't recall a single game that causes this simply overwhelming feeling as much as this one does. So many realizations strike you as you learn about each aspect of the game. You ship your first crop, then sometime after open the collections tab and see that there's dozens of others to grow, same with fishing. Or when you give your first gift and open up the social tab and see the various townspeople that all have scripted events which happen as you get friendlier with them and possibly marry. And who can forget the community center, with every single bundle you complete, you unlock a whole variety of bundles, which then go on to work the exact same way. With each one crossed off your list, the game seems to somehow expand even more by unlocking a new location. I think I did my best to explain this feeling, but nothing beats actually playing the game. And the fact that it leaves you to do whatever the hell you want doesn't necessarily mean that it won't gently push you into trying out other stuff. 
For example, in order to survive the deeper levels in the mines, you need a big backpack with lots of food. The backpack costs a good amount of gold early on, and the only realistic way to earn it is either through fishing or growing your farm. The exact same goes for getting your food. The different aspects of the game connect like a spider web so beautifully, and it makes that grasping the sheer amount of content so much more natural. Number 6. The game is very wholesome. These times can be quite stressful for some people, and video games are a great escape for that, yet almost any game can stress you out too, no matter what its intention is. Not Stardew Valley though, the game's world is stress-free and cheery, I can't recall a single thing that could possibly bum you out, except two things. The first one is dying in the mine, since you lose so much stuff and you can only get one of them back. However, you can go in, pocket stuffed with 50 various food items like in Skyrim, which pretty much makes you immortal. And the second thing is maybe those serious conversations you sometimes have with the villagers, though I highly doubt it. And finally, number 7, this is one of the best games to play while in an online meeting. Now, I obviously don't think you should play anything while in a meeting, but that would be like telling a curious teenager to just not try weed. If you know they're gonna try it no matter what, it might as well be in the safest way, and you can't go safer than Stardew Valley, as you can perfectly focus on what's being talked about. In fact, you can watch as well, and not even with a second monitor, it's actually even better with a little picture-in-picture -picture tab since your eyes won't have to travel as much, and it doesn't affect your gameplay either, put it in the top left and you won't be missing much. Stadio Valley is also great for listening to podcasts or albums or really anything you want to listen to, but can just sit there and do nothing at all in the meantime. So, let's get into the things I couldn't squeeze into that first section of the video. Firstly, we obviously have your farm, of which you can choose 7 different types. They all provide vastly different layouts, with some cutting the available tiles in as much as half. Some spawn monsters, others have forage, and most have some kind of body of water for fishing. All of them honestly seem so different and interesting, but I'll stop here since I've only tried the default one so far. The farming part of your farm is ironically the one aspect of the game you have spent the least amount of time on at the end of your journey, whenever that is. It's extremely simple since there is no other way to execute it really. You plant a ton of crops at the beginning of the season, then a couple of times after, and only water them manually for so long before you get to sprinklers and basically forget about them forever. You can also plant fruit trees and they don't require anything but for you to pick them. The picking of anything is always satisfying due to the chance of them being silver or golden, which increases their price respectively. The animals in your farm are also nice, though they can't be automated so you have to pet them and milk them yourself at the very least, if not put down their hay if you don't have the deluxe barn yet. If you don't care about the materials such as wool and feathers that they provide, I don't actually think you have any reason to own animals at all. The time can be spent more efficiently elsewhere and you can get unbelievably rich with just the crops alone. Oh, and you can also cook in your house, but I never dabbled in it as much, so I'll leave it at that. I didn't have many problems with the base building in this game, or rather home building, since there isn't anything else to consider when it comes to the default farm other than practicality and aesthetics. There's something so satisfying about constantly clearing the respawning forage and trees, and slowly filling up each tile of the farm with something useful. There are tiles that you can't build on, however, and for no apparent reason the way I see it, Otherwise, it gives so much freedom and it's amazing to see just how creative some people get with it. The relationships and friendships you can develop with the villagers are great in some ways and not so much in others. I love all the characters, they're very charismatic and actually quite interesting. The events that come up, whether they be as you gain more hearts or simply scheduled to happen on a certain date, are all pretty cool, even though I obviously haven't seen all of them, as there are so many. It's easily one of the biggest parts of the game. Shane's events in particular are great, though I won't spoil them, discovering them on your own can be quite... surprising. For me, I'd say they're worth the hassle of giving gifts, but that's the second thing. That's a lot of hassle. The outcomes are all great, yet the way you arrive there can be quite cumbersome. Taking the approach of no googling is complete cancer in the beginning of the game. There is so much trial and error as you try to find out who likes what, and where they even are at what time of the day so you can give it to them. You'll be wasting so many items on people that don't even like them. Ice cream, description, it's hard to find someone who doesn't like this. Well, guess what, Emily doesn't, and you'll lose points if you give it to her, literally. There are special notes you can get, and some that might drop will tell you what gifts particular people like, however, you only start getting them in the beginning of winter, which is more than 20 hours in, and I don't see any reason why. 
And don't even get me started on the townspeople that just stand in their room all day and never actually come out for you to give them the thing. This isn't just on birthdays, it's also for quests or gifts at the end of the week or something. What could have possibly happened if we could just knock on the door, make them come over and give them the gift? This doesn't happen that often, but then again, I usually don't even bother giving gifts on non-birthdays anyway. And possibly the worst one in the whole game is this. Uh, really? I can't just, you know, reach over and give it to her? It's her birthday and she's not leaving for the whole day it seems. Alright then. On top of that, each heart represents 250 friendship points. This can be confusing since you can give someone two gifts which they seem to like yet not fill up a single heart. Do I get a heart when giving a gift after filling up those two check marks or what the hell do they mean? When it comes to the fishing however, it's surprisingly fun. There's a lot of mastery involved, as weird as that sounds, and I almost felt like I was using some sort of tracking hack by the time I reached level 10 on fishing and was good enough. It's so good, it's in fact the first skill I maxed out, and way before all the others. However, I think there are too many fish that are too easy and too many that are too hard. The bottom of the barrel, fish, will allow you to take a bathroom break while you're catching them, while the harder ones, mainly the legendary fish, will snap and jump all over the place. It's basically impossible to know what they're gonna do, you just kinda have to get lucky. There aren't many instances where the struggle drags on just enough, but not too much. Enough for you to pay attention and maybe turn down the podcast you're listening to, but still not be too frustrating. Another way to get points is by completing quests. You'll get some in your mailbox every once in a while and can hold on to them forever. As soon as I actually started making some money, which was like 10 days in, almost all of them became not worth it for how much money you get. This is fine since you also get some good old friendship points, but the quest doesn't say that. And the notices that get put up in the town square, the help wanted quest, do state they give friendship, so the logical conclusion for anyone would be why should I do the mail quest if they don't give me that? As for the help wanted quests themselves, they're usually something like Emily going, oh yeah, I'd like to put a 2.5 carat diamond under my pillow, you know, nothing crazy, could someone bring me one? We might grow a little closer, as long as you don't give me ice cream later, that is. You also unlock special orders at the beginning of your first fall. Depending on what they require you to do, they can take up anywhere from a couple of in-game hours each day to your whole schedule for the preceding week. And the time frames range from one day to literally a whole season. They do offer a proper reward as well, a unique recipe, stock unlock or item that you can't get anywhere else, some gold and sometimes friendship too. It's not made clear either however, sadly. Next, I'll comment on the mines as they were the place I spent the most time in early on due to the fact that they're also the most addictive part of it for me. They have 120 floors, with each of them the loot and ores become better and the monsters progressively harder. On top of that, every 10 floors you get a chest with some sort of useful item. I won't say what the cooler ones are, but they're really useful, it keeps you wanting to explore more for sure. You often get equipment too, and a lot of time it's a weapon. The time management and inventory management part of it turned this otherwise dizzy dungeon crawler into a more engaging one. However, and I have to preface this with, I know you don't buy Stardew Valley for the combat, it can feel very repetitive and boring or even annoying at times. It's the weakest part of the game for sure, when the enemies get more and more difficult, they don't actually get more and more difficult. They just get more HP and you have to sit there hitting them for 10 seconds. Don't even get me started on the flying ones, who you can knock back across the whole screen and have to wait for them to fly to you, then do it again like 7 times. It's so exhausting. Mowing through a bunch of slime pinned up against the wall is satisfying, sure, but remove the wall and the whole experience turns into a I chase it around, then the second one hits me from the side and slows me down and now they're all over me and oh my god, I hate this. The more I played, the more I started resenting the combat and all the more often it made me go, oh sh**, here we go again, whenever I spotted an enemy. The controls are also not the best in the world, sometimes you strike towards your cursor and sometimes wherever you're facing. The worst problem was getting stuck in infinite swinging time loops or whatever you wanna call them. Basically, as long as you keep spamming left click, you can't switch your weapon and you can't turn. I see no gameplay advantage for this whatsoever and it forces you to take your time while a flying lizard is furiously coming for you. The second mines you can unlock are the quarry ones, which are a once in a lifetime experience. As in, you'll go there, clear the annoying skulls, which are still the best flying enemy in the game since they don't take their time, go to the Grim Reaper statue and pick up the golden sight, then finally never return again. 
This is the most random thing in the whole game. The site is literally just a gold level version of your site. The place doesn't have any farmable enemies since they almost never drop anything and there is no ore. The rocks don't even drop stones and you unlock another mine with which to farm them infinitely anyway. Finally, we have that very farming mine, the bottomless one in the desert, aka the Skull Cavern. There we find some reskins, uh, I mean unique enemies, and the lower you descend, the better the ores get. It's all about seeing how long you can last and how deep you can go. <sighs> anyway, you have these chasms you can jump into and fall up to 15 levels down, I think, and it's a perfect addition for this version of the mines. It adds a little more RNG to push you to unexpectedly low levels, and it's already incredibly engaging to warp there at 6am with a totem, be as efficient as you possibly can and mine dozens of iridium ores, then warp back to your farm 20 minutes before the day ends. Then we have the community center and museum, which are two of my favorite ideas in the whole game, since I'm kind of a completion cuck. And the former's execution is simply great, you have all the themed community center bundles and each of them offers some kind of useful reward, while a whole section gives something so good that it's more suited as a reward for completing the whole center altogether. I would have said that they are too easy to complete and should have had absolutely every single item in the game instead, but that's what the collection type is for. This is just a slight push for you to dive at least a little into each aspect of the game. I also truly, truly appreciate that you can look at your progress from anywhere on the map. There would have been tons of what is essentially backtracking otherwise. You can also move over an item and have the icon on the right shake if it's needed for the center, and that's just a great quality of life feature. The same isn't true for your collection, however, when it comes to the first section, the shipment one, and that's kind of odd. There are some items like forage plants and produce that are absolutely there and either already shipped or not, yet you have to open the tab, scan through it and see for yourself. Otherwise, the community center and collection are amazing additions. The museum, on the other hand, I'm kind of split on. You'll find many different minerals and artifacts on your travels, whether it be by digging up worms, breaking geodes, finding treasures when fishing and some other less common ways. And when I got a duplicate of an artifact for the first time, pretty early on, I said to myself, uh oh, this isn't gonna be what I think it's gonna be, is it? And it was. Pretty soon, finding a new artifact was basically a miracle, since finding an artifact in the first place was rare anyway. But then I realized I had just 10 artifacts left and all those missing spaces I had in the display were simply minerals. You can trade in 5 Omni Geos for a treasure trove which is guaranteed to contain one of 27 different artifacts, and that's where almost all of mine were left. Some of them do have less than 0.5% chance to drop however and that can be understandably annoying for lots of people. I don't plan on fully completing this game right now anyway so it honestly doesn't bother me at all. Yet. It might in the future if I decide to 100% the game though. The minerals do have a 1% chance as well and there are so many of them left for me, but they all drop off of Omni Geodes and you can find the crap out of those in the school cavern easily. Oh, and you can also find books for the museum, but they aren't physical items so you can get duplicates. Next is the storage management. Stardew Valley is sadly one of the games that has chests with a finite number of slots, but doesn't really seem to know why. It's not a survival game, so I don't believe it wants much inventory management when it comes to your storage, mining is obviously a different story, and I don't think it's doing it for any realism either. This game is massive and we have so many different types of items, let alone 4 different qualities for some and at least 3 for most, and the only way to have a decently organized storage is to put a bunch of separate chests, then have to remember what goes in which, and painstakingly open each of them one by one, then click add to stack. Time doesn't pass while you're looking at a chest, but my real life time does, and it's a giant waste of it. If anything, they should have let you quick stack to nearby chests like in Terraria. It sounds lame, but I sometimes cashed in items I actually needed since it got too damn annoying to sort everything. I think that shows just how bad it is. I'm not gonna go off on a tangent, but a lot of games do this and it's frankly bullshit. I think they'd benefit from having one big chest whose space can be upgraded with materials. It could be separated into different sections with the spaces in each customizable, be it with simple borders on a big scrollable page or through flippable individual pages. You could name them, color them, customize them however the hell you want. It will also have a search bar, obviously. Hell, make this super chest take up two times the space normal chests do for how many slots it has. I don't care. Stardew Valley has such great design and I was very surprised it half has this part of it so much. We also have the fact that you're forced to wait two whole days for your tools to upgrade after you hand them over to Clint. 
Now, the following problem might be coming from me, but I wanted to upgrade the less useful tools just for the sake of it, tools such as the trash can or the watering can which pretty much becomes obsolete after installing sprinklers. Yet I honestly just didn't want to bother since I don't need them that much anyway. That's how annoying it is. Besides, whilst working on the tools, Clint cannot break open your geodes and I see absolutely no reason for that whatsoever. With the first issue, you at least have the justification of it prevents you from mining or cutting wood all day since you're missing your tools and thus forces you to explore the other parts of the game as you should, but even that isn't true. A, a big part of the game is player choice, so why not leave the player to mine and chop wood all day if they want to? B, if you don't agree with that, well, the game kind of doesn't too, but it only incentivizes you to partake in each activity as we said, it doesn't force you to. Finally, I mentioned that I wanted to upgrade the tools just for the sake of it, but when would most people be most likely to upgrade the watering can? Probably before they get all their sprinklers, which means they need the watering can. Do you lose much if you don't water your crops for two days? No, you actually don't lose anything, they just don't grow for a day. And you can mitigate one of them by waiting for the weather forecast to say it's gonna rain tomorrow anyway, but I honestly see no reason to even create this inconvenience in the first place, in a game like Stardew Valley. And when it comes to your hoe, it prevents you from digging up warm piles, so you simply have to stare at them. And that's just annoying. Continuing, the same is true for building upgrades. You have to wait multiple days for each of them to upgrade. Building a coop, a level 2 coop, a level 3 coop, level 1, 2, 3 barn, upgrading your house multiple times, you get it. This is extremely annoying as well. If you can already afford all these upgrades, then you likely won't get access to too many animal housing buildings early on and thus break the game, since you somehow already did break the game in order to do that, and I see no other reason for the building times. Except of course, giving off the illusion that there are so many more things to do than there actually are. This works both with upgrading your tools and your buildings, hoarding resources and constructing a 3 level coop immediately would be just a fragment in my memory, but doing it 3 times to get it is a very memorable and more time consuming one. Yet, the only real reason I remember it is because it was annoying, and the game already has such a plethora of content that I find this completely unnecessary in the first place. When it comes to bugs, the only ones I've ever had a problem with were these extremely annoying flies like I said, and those times where my cat refuses to let me enter my room. I make sure to get home a little earlier each night in case that happens. Usually you can clip through them if the game recognizes that you're running into something and can't get through, but it doesn't happen here. Like, just look at this, it's ridiculous. Finally, I have almost nothing to say about the visuals in this game other than they're beautiful, you get desensitized to it after dozens and dozens of hours of looking at this small town, sure, but stopping for a moment and just staring at the pixel art was very common for me at first. However, I do think Harvey's model looks literally nothing like him. In conclusion, Stardew Valley is one of the most brimming with content, addicting and relaxing games I've ever played. If you haven't checked it out, I highly recommend it. A 14 year game with a 97% positive rating on Steam, not very many flaws and at least 50 hours game time, with the possibility of pretty much infinite game time. And I'll give Stardew Valley a medium 9 out of 10. And that was it for this in-depth Stardew Valley design analysis or whatever you want to call it. Ring the bell, share, like, comment and so on, make sure to check out my rating list if you're interested. I also keep all my video ideas there and what I'm currently working on, it's linked on my channel. And as always, subscribe if you like this type of content and want to see more of it. Thanks for sticking around and I'll see you in the next video.